Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm glad you all are here. If you're joining us online, we're glad you can join us that way. Um, uh, we've got our uh, post-Christmas schedule flip-flop this year. Next Sunday, um, we'll still be on our way back into town. Um, very, it'll be a very short trip um, to see my folks uh, this week. Uh, we'll have lessons and carols next week. Um, so we're I'm having uh, the first Sunday after Christmas for the first time since I've been here, uh, maybe, maybe for the first time in a very long time. But um, there's no Sunday school this week. There's no Sunday school next week. It'll resume the following week. There's a couple other dates in your calendar, deadlines for um, the annual report, uh, deadlines for the January, February newsletter, and also the date for our annual meeting, which will be here immediately following worship at the end of January. And we are not going to try to do a hybrid Zoom in-person meeting this year, I don't think. Um, we may be able to broadcast whatever is taking place here, but to actually participate in the meeting, to have our quorum, we'll need to have you in person here. So uh, please uh, keep that in mind as the end of January approaches. That is all of my announcements. I invite those of you here with me in person to stand as we begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who sends the word with angels, who has made flesh among all peoples, and who breathes peace on all the earth. Amen. In Christ, we are bold to name our sin and cry out for peace. Holy God, we confess our sin before you. We replace compassion with competition. We seek what is mighty while ignoring the weak. We are quick to anger, but slow to forgive. We have not put on love in harmony with you. Wrap us in the grace of your powerful word. Swaddle our hearts with your peace, that all we do, in word or deed, may reflect your love born among us. Amen. I bring you good news of great joy for all people, God has come among us in the child born of Mary, Christ the Lord. In Christ, your sins are forgiven, and you are clothed in peace. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number 288, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Shine into our hearts the light of your wisdom, O God, 
and open our minds to the knowledge of your word, that in all things we may think and act according to your good will, and may live continually in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Having dedicated her son Samuel to God's service, Hannah visits him every year when she and her husband Elkanah come to the temple to offer sacrifices. God grants Hannah more children, and Samuel himself gains favor in the sight of all. Our first reading today is from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. Now Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. <clears throat> Alleluia, praise the Lord. Praise God in the heights. Praise the Lord, all you angels. Sing praise, all you hosts of heaven. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praise, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, heaven and heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded and they were created, who made them stand fast forever and ever, giving them a law that shall not pass away. The splendor of the Lord is over the earth and the Lord from the earth, you see monsters and all deeps, the iron hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind doing God's will, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world, young men and maidens, old and young together. The splendor of the Lord is with heaven. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name only exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the people and praised for all faithful servants, the children of Israel, the people who are near the Lord. Alleluia. The splendor of the Lord is over. Just as newly baptized Christians in the early church were clothed with new garments upon arising from the baptismal waters, so all who have received God's gift of life in Jesus Christ 
are covered with the character of Christ. Our second reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. I'd like to take just a few moments to speak directly to our youngest worshipers. Good morning, guys. Um, for those of you here on Christmas Eve, we got some less stuff in here. It's not all gone, but um, there's just a little, the, the wreath is down, and um, over the next couple of weeks, the garland will come down, the flowers will be put away, which I'm really glad for, because it took me five years and some help from Caleb, but I finally knocked one of the poinsettias over on Christmas Eve. <laughs> you guys didn't see that, did you? Yeah, nobody saw it. Except the folks who are up there with me saw it. Yeah, Lila knows. Lila, I almost dropped it on her foot. Um, um, you may be wondering, after all the excitement of Christmas, what now? I mean, yeah, there's new clothes to wear and new toys to play with. Um, and But I don't know, uh, in our house, the... Um, uh, the family who are staying with us are gone. It's going to be a few days before we see any more family. And, um, and then we'll be done. We won't see them again for a while. So I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm sort of wonder after Christmas, after all the excitement is worn off, what next? And um, the reading that uh, Mike just shared for us is a picture of maybe what comes next. Um, that reading doesn't talk about um, the clothing that we got in gift bags or, or unwrapped uh, from gift boxes, but says that we actually can wear being kind and being humble and being patient like clothing. Now, my two who are in the room with us are not in the spirit of being patient and kind all the time right now, right? Because there's just been too much excitement. So the good thing is Immediately after those things, the reading says, we can forgive each other for those things, and we can be thankful. It may be a bit much to ask brother and sister um, to be bound together in perfect harmony, right? Probably not going to be some perfect harmony, especially in the van. But the author also suggests that it's always a good time to sing and to do everything in the Lord's name. And if we look back at the confession that we shared, at the beginning of worship, we're reminded that we tend as people, and that's not just kids, but also grown-ups, we tend to be drawn to other people who seem powerful and other kids who seem popular. We get angry quickly, we get frustrated quickly, but we're much slower to forgive. And that whole harmony thing, yeah. But we hear this word of forgiveness, that Jesus came on Christmas to forgive and to show us how to forgive and to show us that no matter how mad or frustrated or impatient or unkind or any of those other things we get, all of that is forgiven by Jesus. And that's what the day after Christmas means for me. Thank you, guys. Please stand for the gospel acclamation.
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a whole day's journey. They started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. It's deeply ironic to me, and y'all know how I love irony, that I've gone years not hearing this reading because it just so happens the, the, the readings for the first Sunday and Christmas are hardly ever what I'm, I'm exposed to. And even when I am, these, this particular reading only comes around every third year on Luke's year. So even uh, when I was preaching at my sister's church a few years ago on the Sunday after Christmas, this, this wasn't the reading. Um, so I haven't heard this reading until I've got lots of experience wondering where my kids are at. <laughs> um, it all started early in the pandemic when one of them figured out how to ride a bicycle. And we have a nice little safe, uh, fairly safe cul-de-sac to ride bikes on. But then, of course, the cul-de-sac was not enough. So we finally, after a couple times, uh, one going missing, uh, we institute a system of walkie-talkies, which is great until, like, the walkie-talkies batteries die, or you're sitting on the button, or you turn the volume down, or, you know, all sorts of things go wrong. So the longest I think we've ever gone, not exactly sure where one of the big kids was, was still less than an hour. Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus, a hair older than ours, but not much, kept his parents looking for him for three straight days. Jenny wouldn't be looking for him. She'd be in the hospital with a combination of a panic attack and a heart attack, right? The police would have been called. The helicopters would be out. The National Guard. He'd be on, it's, it's, you know which one it is, right? He would be on the side of milk cartons, right? I can joke, there's a whole story, and I don't remember the details. My brother was about 12 uh, when he got, he and a friend wandered off at a, a school, uh, school-related camp trip, uh, a day camp. They, they didn't make it that far, but they really did call everyone out. I don't know that my parents ever knew what happened until he was found. Three whole days. And there is 12-year-old Jesus sitting in the temple chatting up the adults, right? And then the sass from this boy, the savior of the nations, didn't you know I'd have to be at my dad's house? First of all, a little twi twist of the knife, stepdad. Didn't you know that I needed to be in my father's house? Which raises an interesting question. You know, why was Jesus still living with his parents? We see in our first reading, Samuel, and we're not told how old he is, but think of this, at 12, in that day and age, Jesus is already on the cusp of adulthood from that society's point of view. Now, he didn't start his earthly ministry until he was about 30, but at 13, 14, for all we know, and 
too much of this is probably made, but for all we know, Mary was only a little bit older than that when she had Jesus. So, so Jesus is still referred to as a boy. And we don't know how old Samuel was, but it's clear that Samuel, from the story, that Samuel had gone to be with Eli, to live with him, and mom would visit him once a year. My parents like to see me more often than that, and I'm in my 40s. They don't really want to see me. They want to see the grandkids. No, they actually, they really do want to see me. It was rough that whole year where a lot of us didn't see our parents and our kids and our grandkids, right? We pray we don't go back to that. For Jesus to turn around and to his mom, who, you know, so often in the Bible, we're wondering, what were these people thinking? What was going on in their heads? And we want to be really careful not to, like, psychologize Jesus, because we will never get inside his head, and the text never helps. But Mary, this morning, we can get right into, our, into her head, because she says, your father and I have been looking for you in great anxiety. And no wonder. They're still responsible for him. They still worry about him. And here he is chatting up the adults in the temple. It's, it's the time of year. It's Passover. It's the time of the year to be doing such things. And maybe this suggests that Mary is really not ready to let go of Jesus, to let him out into the wider world and all that represents. And the truth is... This is our only picture in the four canonical Gospels of Jesus from basically infancy until he shows up on the scene in his 30s. This is the one glimpse we get of him. And that tells us a little something about Luke, because Luke, of all the four Gospels, is the one most concerned with narrative and story. He's the one, I mean, here we are in chapter 2, and we have gotten all of this background on not just Jesus' birth, but John the Baptist's birth, all of this narrative setup, all of this foreshadowing. I'll come back to that in a bit, if I remember. Foreshadowing about foreshadowing. Now I have to remember, right? Luke is the gospel that has the most parables that are told in the form of stories. By far the longest parables show up in Luke's gospel. Um, You know, Mark, just like Jesus, shows up and starts doing things. And then next he does something else. Next he does something else. John and Matthew, each in their own way, put lots of words in Jesus' mouth. Long speeches for Matthew. It's long blocks of teaching. For John, it's long poetic. I mean, just just particularly in his last week, open up your Bible to the, the last week and it's just... If you have a red-letter Bible, it's red letters for chapter after chapter. You wonder if he took a breath in between sometimes, right? But Luke is the one who is concerned with the details of story. And in this story, there is so much foreshadowing. But there's also a glimpse of Jesus as a child that I think is important. And it's different from the glimpse of Jesus you would get as a child in some of the Gospels that didn't make it into the Bible. There are some other stories, and frankly, they're kind of weird. And they tend to make Jesus into something of a child horror show. I mean, he's got too much power in that little body. Um, And so he does horrible things and then tries to fix them. And it just, it's creepy. Um, And that's not at all the picture Luke gives us. Luke has this kid who's wise beyond his years. Well, you know kids like that, right? Kids who are more comfortable around adults. I was one of those kids for the most part at that age. But also at the very end of our reading for today, Jesus increased in wisdom and in years. We often think, well, Jesus was born son of God and son of humans, and so he came with everything he needed. But no, in some way, Jesus did not come into the world with it all figured out, which suggests the possibility that even in his earthly ministry, as much as he knows more about what's coming than his disciples, he doesn't know 
to the day or the date or even exactly what's going to happen. He knows where it has to end up. But it suggests that this was something that unfolded in his life over time. And how about this, that he, he increased in human and divine favor. Like, how much more in God's favor could you be than sending signs to shepherds and wise men and, and all these things? It, it points to at least Jesus' baptism, the announcement, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. But back to that foreshadowing, many things about Jesus' life and his ministry and even his death and resurrection are foreshadowed in this story. Even as a 12-year-old, Luke says, we know where this story is going. Even if Jesus didn't quite know, they, sp they find Jesus sitting in the temple in Jerusalem after Passover. Where does Jesus' earthly ministry end? In Jerusalem, at the temple, the Passover. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John disagree about whether it was on the Passover or right after the Passover, but at that holiest of days for his time, it's a reminder that Jesus, this is important for us, Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus was Jewish with all of the package of observances and holy days and all the rest that comes with having grown up in that family. And although we hear about, uh, we hear so often about Mary, we hear much less about Joseph. There's a hint here of the wider family that he would have grown up in because Mary and Joseph go searching for him among their relatives and their friends. He was part of a larger human family than the, the, the little blip in the manger scenes, the nativity scenes that we have. And there's at least one more bit of foreshadowing in this story. It's in three days, after three days of anxious, frantic searching. And if you've ever been a parent or a grandparent or even just in loco parentis for a child, you, you think the worst, right? I don't know any parent of a newborn that doesn't go in to check the breathing, you know, when they're in the crib. Like, eventually you come to trust that, sort of. Or the way the mind wanders and the heart worries when you don't know where your kids are. Like, you trust that they're safe, but you also know that horrible things happen to people. And so for those three days, for Mary and Joseph, like, they know, they trust, but the kid, to them, is as good as dead. Like the prodigal son, the one who was dead is alive. He's alive. I see him. I can touch him. He's here with me. And so it is after three days in the grave when Jesus rose again. Even those who had at that point given up hope because they didn't understand how it had to be, they say, he's alive. He's come back to us. And so here... In this one little vignette, this 12-year-old twerp, you kind of want to wring his neck. You know, show some respect for your mother. And Luke assures us he went back with them, and he was obedient to them after that. <laughs> and then that beautiful line from the Christmas story repeated one more time. Now that he has come back to his mom, at least for now, she can again treasure all of these things in her heart. Amen.
Our hymn of the day is hymn number 269, Once in Royal David's City. share together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. Joining our voices with the heavenly host and Christians throughout time and space. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. You come to us in gatherings of your church across the globe. Unite us with those who celebrate your birth, even when they are weighed down by grief, loss, poverty, hunger, or injustice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us in the diverse splendor of the universe. Grant us the humility to trust our place in the network of creation, that we live in service to you and the natural world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us through relationships of many kinds, families, friendships, communities, and nations. Guide us in these relationships that we recognize the Christ child in one another and show your love to those most vulnerable. Merciful God, receive our prayer. 
You come to us through people whom the world forgets. Poor shepherds and an impoverished Paul announced your good news. Send your spirit to all who are imprisoned, struggling with addiction, unwell, or in any need this day. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us in acts of justice and forgiveness. Open our hearts to forgive one another without permitting injustice. Supply us with the wisdom to be clothed with love, binding all things together in perfect harmony. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You come to us through those who have died yet live with you forever, including Pastor Don Marshall and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. We give thanks for Stephen, deacon and martyr, who gave his life to tell the story of your love. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Rejoicing in your word made flesh among us, we commend these prayers to you, confident of your grace and love, made known to us in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you always. Let's share that peace with those around us. Gracious God, your word made flesh brings harmony to the earth. As we offer ourselves and these your gifts, prepare us to receive the grace and truth you offer at this table, and renew in us the song of your salvation, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy. That we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory. In the holding of the God made visible, we may be drawn to the love to love the God whom we cannot see. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in your unending hymn. Mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who, on the cross, opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share. 
share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's manger, at Christ's table, come. See what God makes known for you. Jesus. 